I am so excited to be here with Juliet Ehuman because this has been something I've been waiting for a long time. We actually know each other for ages. Thank you for coming on the show, Juliet. Thanks, Sigrun. It's great to be here. Lovely to see you again. So we met each other in 2006 when we both started uh, our executive MBA at London Business School. And in addition to being in class together, also we got a scholarship from the school, both of us, because they were seeking women who would turn into future leaders. And we definitely have, and especially you, Juliet. <laughs> Thank you. I'll say the same about you, Sigrun. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to talk about excellence in this podcast. Uh, you you are a director of uh, Google in uh, Nigeria, West South, West yeah, West Africa, and uh, but on top of that, or as a as a side project, you also uh, are you know someone who offers master classes and written a book, and you teach people how to be excellent. Before we go into that topic a deeper, how to be reach excellence. We want to a little bit follow your journey. Like what has happened since that executive MBA studies? <laughs> That's a great question. So we finished our MBA in 2008. Gosh, it feels like ages now. It's, it's been over 10 years, Sigrun. We're getting old. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so uh, post MBA, I uh, took on the responsibility for a leading ICT organization in Nigeria that was looking to diversify. Um, it's business. During the MBA, I was actually uh, in entrepreneurship and I was looking at um, projects to facilitate knowledge and best practice sharing between African leaders and their global counterparts and doing that back and forth. Right. Um, so so I have always had an interest in, in development, in knowledge sharing. And the focus at the time as well was on Africa. And so uh, when approached by this organization, I saw an opportunity to actually make a difference in, in diversifying the, the lines of business. So I, I was based in London at the time, moved back and um, to, to Nigeria, did that for a couple of years, and then Google came along. So I started working at Google in April 2011. So I actually celebrated my 10 year anniversary at Google uh, in April this wow. year. So it's been wow. a long ride. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's been interesting. Yeah. So you know, because I am a gender equality advocate, uh, it makes me really happy to see Google hire a woman for a position like that. Has there been any kind of, you know, do you feel like this has also changed things around, uh, you know, uh, your country or generally in Africa that you are heading up this position instead of a man? I would say in general, there is a higher focus on gender diversity. Suddenly at Google, there's a huge commitment to just really looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion. Wow. And then when I look at the landscape, when I started out in my career, um, if I think back to when I was in school, I was one of two women in engineering. <laughs> and there have been times in my career where I was the minority in terms of either gender or even race, right? Yeah. But that has changed now. We have, we're seeing a lot more women in leadership positions in the technology space. And of course, mm -hmm. there's still a huge room for, for growth, but it's good to see that the trend is changing. And uh, of course, because we know women bring uh, an incredible amount to the table. So it's good to see that more and more that is top of mind in organizations. Yeah. It does. I feel it changes when it's also at the top. You know, when you see women at the top, it, it gives, you know, the impression that they can also go up through the ranks in these companies and, you know, follow their dreams, which is one of my goals to just have women. We need role models and you are one of those. So thank you for that. Thanks, Sigrun. Now you make a very important point. It, we do need um, role modeling. It plays a, a very important role because when people see someone like them, it just gives them access. It just helps to show that this is possible. It's not so far out there, unreachable, something I can't touch, right? It brings it closer as something I can aspire to. 
And so you know, role modeling is key. And that's why it's important that we're deliberate about making sure that there is diversity and inclusion in, uh, you know, across board. Yeah, exactly. So you've been 10 years at Google. Uh, what, what has really been like your biggest projects that you're most proud of? So I started at Google when we were still uh, really building out the market, right? Uh, when we started, the digital landscape was still uh, in early stages of development. There were more people coming online, but still a huge headroom for growth. And so our strategy has been very focused on three things. And, uh, you know, one is just making sure that the internet is more accessible to everyone, um, working with partners. And another is just making sure there's local content so that the internet is relevant to people. And then the third bucket is ca uh, capacity building, investing in education in initiatives. Now, what I'm really proud of is the work that we've done to impact in a positive way, the digital landscape in Nigeria and across Africa. As an example, we're currently investing in training 10 million people for free across the continent. We made this commitment in 2017. To date, we've trained over 5 million. We also have a program to support early stage technology startups across Africa. We started that as well in 2017 and we've graduated a number of startups. It's, it's so refreshing to see some of the unicorns in the technology entrepreneurship space that we're seeing in Africa and noting that uh, uh, quite a few of them went through this our accelerator program for startups. So yeah, there's some you know, popular names of um, very successful investments uh, uh, and, and growth, stories of growth, particularly in the FinTech space. So it's great to just see our initiatives also having an impact that is so wide reaching. I'll just give one more example. We've also been investing in training developers um, and we've trained uh, thousands of developers through an African scholarships program. And there've been some great success stories. Again, my passion is very much around empowerment. And when you see how people have been successful in using technology to enhance themselves, to create opportunity for themselves, to grow their businesses, it's just really refreshing. So those are the, 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 that's the body of work that I'm really proud of. I love that. I love seeing your updates on social media, what you're doing. And so there we come to, you actually have a passion project outside your regular job or, or how did that start? You know, is it a part of your job or is it completely separate? Right. So that started, like you said, it is a passion uh, project that started from a, from a very young age, as far back as I can remember, I've always been drawn to wanting to be the best version of myself. And I remember we had conversations about it like, like this when we were at business school. So it's something that has always been <laughs> a key thing about me, right? So I've you know, consumed material. I, I keep looking at self-improvement and things like that. And I've been inspired as well to share what I'm learning with other people. And so that's how we started out, just sharing some of these concepts. And then I started to get very positive feedback and I could see the demand and the opportunity. And so that just really called me to do more and spend more time uh, investing in these initiatives. And so uh, from time to time, I do masterclasses around self-leadership, personal effectiveness, transformation, and also um, uh, coaching, um, not on a regular basis because the day job is very demanding, yeah. but as much as I can. And I do see a fusion between both because uh, you know, in my job in the uh, technology space, there's a huge opportunity to just really show individuals and organizations how they can empower themselves and grow using digital technology with access to information, with productivity tools and all of that, right? And um, so, so, so there's that. And then also in complementing that is, is the work that I do um, with the master classes. Uh, and some of that is also infused into, you know, how I work with my team, um, you know, at Google and um, participation in empowerment initiatives within the organization as well. Yeah. One question comes to mind as you're sharing this. A lot of women say they don't have time, but you have a very demanding job <laughs> and you are able 
to still look after your passion project. You've also written a book. You're doing these master classes and you are constantly improving yourself personally, you have self personal development and business development. How do you find the time? I, I'm asking this question for my listeners. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a good point about time because uh, I always say time is the currency of life. If you're alive, what do you have? It's time, right? And that's why we talk about spending time the way you spend money or wasting time the way you waste money, right? But time is the only resource that you can't keep in a bank. It gets spent and so does life. As time passes, so does life. So it's so key how we spend our time. And um, there's, there's a, the quality of your life in many ways is reflected in how you spend your time. So for me, it's about working smartly. You know, I am privileged to be in an organization where that stuff of mine is just really about um, you know, working smartly, you have the tools, you have the flexibility, you have the resources to, to actually just really, you know, uh, zoom in and generate results. So there's that, but also in organizing everything else, it's just really being top of mind about el eliminating some time wasters <laughs> in your day and being deliberate about ensuring that you're spending your time on things that really matter to you and move you closer to your, your vision, your aspirations. Mm. So you haven't written this book now, you've been doing these masterclasses and you, yeah. you're truly passionate about excellence. So someone listening, like, what do you mean? How can I become a better version of myself? Do you have some steps or tips that you can share with the listeners? Absolutely. So um, the book is 30 Days of Excellence. And um, I am actually running an excellence series this month to just really uh, support um, people around imbibing those concepts and, and sharing. And for me, excellence is going over and beyond. There are actually two definitions to excellence. The traditional definition is going over and beyond expectations, ticking the boxes, de delivering to high st standards. That's great. But there's another deeper context around excellence, which is internally driven, which is wanting to be the best version of yourself, which is really setting param parameters and standards, not driven by what people say or, or external forces, but by your own vision, your own understanding of yourself and your capability. Because there are times you do things and people applaud you, but deep down, you know, I haven't done enough. I could yeah. do better. I can be better. I can, I can go higher, all those types of things. So that's another version of excellence. And in that context as well, excellence is a way of being, not necessarily a destination. It's a way of being, right? That, you know, in everything that is in front of you, you're just set up. That's your, that's your North Star, right? Mm. So that's the, that. And then in terms of um, tips for excellence, I'll just mention uh, five things very quickly. One is just the importance of just clarity of uh, a vision and, uh, and purpose. The fact that, you know, life is the best way to, uh, there's a saying about the best way to uh, influence the future is to create it, right? Life is not a series of random events. It's important that we're very deliberate, that you know where you're going. You know, if you're embarking on any journey, right? If you're not clear on what the destination is, then you're not going to go very far. So having that clarity of purpose, I think is very important. Um, and that's usually an intersection of your passion, your strengths and a need, because it's not just about oneself. It's also what value are you putting out in the world? What need are you looking to solve, right? So being clear about your purpose energizes and fuels you. It's also important to um, be clear about what your vision is in different aspects of your life. Life exists in multiple domains. Sometimes we just default to work. Work is great, but life is beyond work. There is family. There is your physical well-being, your finances, your emotional well-being, and so on and so forth, right? So picking a few areas that are top of mind for you and creating a picture of what it is I am looking to have. What are my aspirations? What are my desires? And in doing that, I always encourage people to not be limited by the how. So it's not, you know, um, it's not the time to really think about how is this going to be possible, right? Because then we get into all kinds of limitations and that stops you from dreaming, right? But to focus on the what, what is that thing that calls you, that inspires you? 
And then the third thing, so the purpose as carried out the vision, and then the third thing is just making sure that there is a very robust plan of execution because, you know, a vision without a plan is like wishful thinking, right? It's important where the rubber meets the road, right? Where things really get serious and tangible and concrete is when you then put a plan and the right structures behind that to really move you from where you are to where you want to be. And then of course, following that is actually mo mobilization, mobilizing yourself to get there. And there are a few things that are important uh, uh, from that perspective. One is just, you know, I touched on this earlier, the belief systems that we have, right? You know, um, I talk about two types of beliefs, limiting beliefs and empowering beliefs. <laughs> yeah. Limiting beliefs are all the things we tell ourselves about why it's not possible, you know? Um, I'm, I'm a woman, therefore I can't succeed in technology, right? Or I don't have a sponsor or one thing or the other. Those uh, uh, beliefs tend to bring us down and even prevent us from trying in some cases. And then on the flip side, you have empowering beliefs. And those are beliefs that lift us up. Now, this is not about self-deception. This is not about, you know, something is, is, is the fact and then you're just trying to put a positive dressing over it that is not grounded in reality. That's not what we're talking about. What it is, is usually there's the facts and then there's your story around the facts. And it's in that story that your belief, that's where your belief comes from. So the fact maybe I'm a woman. Yeah, that's a fact, right? The story is therefore I cannot succeed in technology. Well, yeah. what's the evidence? There are many women that are doing amazing things in the technology space. There are many people that don't have sponsors and are doing well, right? So it is to question those assumptions and immediate stories that we create, those default stories, and see what really is the truth, right? And what's an empowering context that I can operate from. So that's the fourth thing. And then the final thing I'll talk about is, and you know, we, we touched on this earlier, is just time. I, I think the way we spend our time is so important. Um, it's important that we're very conscious in making sure that you're spending your time on, on things that move you closer to your vision, which is why it's important to have a vision in the first place, to have that clarity. Because as Lewis Carroll said, um, if you don't know where you're going, then it doesn't matter what road you take. If we're not clear about our vision, then it's easy for you to just be blown by the wind and to entertain all the distractions and everything that, that comes your way. But when you're very clear about your vision, then it's, it's, it's easier for you to prioritize. Because when we talk about time, there's nothing we can do about having 24 hours. Everybody has 24 hours in a day. There's nothing we can do about that, you know? What you can do is what you do in that time, how you prioritize your activities within the time, how you maximize the, the time that is available to you. And when you have a North Star, when you have a vision, when you're clear what you want to achieve, it makes it easy for you to decide on what's in and what's out and to marshal your energy in a way that is that, that really serves you. Yeah, I love those things. These are very much aligned with what I talk about what I what I believe. Uh, it's, it's also my thing. And it's actually thing that has been occupying my mind lately is that once you achieve your vision, you have to also realize like, you have to create a new one. Yep. Absolutely. Life is a constant process of growth. None of this is frozen in time, right? We keep as we learn new things, your vision may expand as you grow. You know, when you were a student, you had a certain vision. It, it maybe was very much really around succeeding as a student, right? And all that, and being a great daughter or, you know, whatever that represents for you. But when you get into the workspace, you know, that's an expanded phase of your life, right? And so it's very likely, it's possible that your vision, you know, expands as a result. The core elements may be the same, maybe the, 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 the core drive within you but how that manifests may change. So since I have here someone from Google, Juliet, <laughs> I need to ask, where is this going? Online business, online work. What, what do you think is changing? We see a lot of changes around the tools we're using, but what has COVID really done for yeah. technology? Yes, so COVID has accelerated the move to digital 
uh, transformation. We know that for a while now, we've seen, we're in the digital age, basically, you know, the, 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 the fourth industrial revolution is a digital revolution. So we are in the di digital age where a lot more things are automated, where a lot more time is spent online and so on. With the pandemic, it became really clear that that transformation, it's not, if it was viewed as a nice to have or an option in the past, now it's a must have. Because the way a lot of businesses maintain some level of continuity during the pandemic was through technology. That's how uh, team members stayed connected. That's how, even on an individual basis, how we stayed connected with, with one another. That's how businesses were able to reach customers and so on. So a lot of organizations that didn't prioritize different aspects of um, automation and just digital transformation are doing that now. And my feedback to any business, small or large, is that ensure that digital transformation is a core part of your strategy. It's not something, it's not an add-on, right? It's, and it's not a question of, okay, we're just gonna deploy this system to take care of this. It needs to be infused into the strategy because through that you can realize the cost gains and efficiencies. You can also get, you know, customer explosion because with digital, you know, depending on the space you're operating in, you remove a lot of physical barriers and boundaries, right? And so you can reach a wider audience. If I just give an example, um, fitness instructors, for example, during the pandemic, uh, quite a number of them went online. Now, if you think about the implications of that, as a fitness instructor, usually your clientele is limited to people within your geography, people that are close to you, that have access to you, either for home visits or even coming to meet you at a studio. You know, geography, location was a big thing. But if you take your instruction online, all of a sudden, your oh, clientele, wow. exactly, it just blows it up. It yeah. opens it up. As long yeah. as you're good at what you do, you can market yourself to the whole world. That's, that's the transition that we're seeing. That's the trend that we're seeing, you know, remote working, remote experiences, expanded customer uh, uh, bases beyond boundaries. And so it's really paramount for every business to embrace digital transformation as an integral part of strategy. Yeah. I am seeing excellence and digital coming a little bit together here because, uh, People are wasting a lot of time online too. Yeah. So, well, so how, how do we tackle excellence when it comes to digital? You know, that's why it's important to be clear about your vision. What do you want to achieve? Because then you can use these tools powerfully. For example, if you go on social media, right? You can spend a lot of time just browsing, you know, no real agenda to it, etc. Some of that is okay. I'm not saying that every time has to be you know, budgeted for in a very strict way, right? But if you're clear what you're aspiring to, there is so much that you can learn by going online. You know, maybe follow people that are, that have done well in your industry, right? Maybe people that have done, that have walked the path that you're trying to walk so that you learn from them. Maybe join interest groups that really speak to the things that are of interest to you and the things you're trying to uh, accomplish. You know, consume material that really develops you and helps you to grow in the direction that you want. So that's why, because technology is a tool, it's a means to an end. What is that end? What is that goal? What is that destination? You need to define that for yourself. Technology will not do that for you. You need to define that. And then use the technology tools and the platforms to your advantage, because there's a lot of empowerment um, that is available as a result. Yeah, so true. Juliet, where is the best place to find you? Uh, we will link to the book, obviously, in the show notes, uh, but what is the best way to find out more about you and uh, your excellence masterclasses? Yes, so um, you can follow me on, you can connect with me on social media at J Ehimuan, that's J-E-H-I-M-U-A-N, and then, as I mentioned, I'm running a free program this month. It's, um, you can register using the link. Uh, it's a bit.ly link, bit.ly slash excellence30. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's 
for the whole month. It's four webinars. It's all online, so you can join from anywhere. It's four webinars every Thursday at 6 p.m. West African, African time. And we go through different aspects of the curriculum around personal effectiveness and self-leadership. And I have some amazing guest speakers as well that will be joining me. So um, if you missed the link, just go on my social media uh, pages on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and uh, WhatsApp, uh, um, Twitter, <laughs> and you'll see information about the program. So I look forward to engaging with everyone on this program. Fabulous. We'll link this all tomorrow. up in the show notes. We're starting tomorrow, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Yeah. We'll link it all up on the show notes so people can find it easily. Juliet, thank, thank you for coming on the show. This was, of course, way too short. Maybe we'll have to connect with you again. Sounds great. It's been a pleasure. And, uh, you know, well done for all the stuff that you're doing. And lovely to see you. <laughs>